Welcome to Hollywood United Methodist Church in this season of Advent. We want everything to look nice. The decorations of the season, our homes with their lights and tinsel, wreaths and ribbons. We want to lighten the darkness around us because bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it is tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. We deck our halls because company is coming. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a fainter spirit. No matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and with joy. We light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of this season. Not just the things that glitter and flash, but the deeper things, the beauty of the heart and the soul, the beauty of love shared in service and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because company is coming. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin McCluskey. I'm the Director of Children and Youth Ministries here, and I'm so happy to be here with my friend, Marilee. Hi, Marilee. Hi. When we're all together in church, we would be sitting on the steps right now, wouldn't we? Yeah. But that's okay. We get to have Zoom. At least we have Zoom. 
Yeah. And um, this is a fun service that we're having today because the children and the youth from our church are very involved in the service. And so I really love this Sunday. In fact, normally we would be doing the Christmas pageant this weekend. Do you remember the Christmas pageant, Marilee? Yep. And do you remember one of the parts that you played? Yeah, once I played the um, the bird seller. The bird? That, you carried around a little bird cage, right, that had birds in it? Mm-hmm. Ah, next year, we will have our Christmas pageant. Anyway, I love Christmas time. I have so, there's so many things about Christmas that I love. Mary Lee, what is one of the things of the Christmas season that you like to do? What is one of your favorite parts oh. of the Christmas season? Hmm. I like decorating the tree and putting up my stockings and decorating the mantle and uh, saying first coming over. Yes, yes. Now, I'm with you 100%. In fact, I just put up my tree yesterday and my kids were here and my mom and it was, I just, I love it. I love it too. And I also, one of the things I love about the Christmas pageant when we do it is that we get to tell the Christmas story. Um, and there are so many cool and interesting parts of the Christmas story. There is the angel who comes to visit Mary. There's the shepherds, the wise men, the, the, the manger. Merrily, of all the different parts of the Christmas story, do you have a favorite part? Hmm. I think one of my favorite parts was when the angels came to Mary and Joseph and told them, you will have a child. His name will be Jesus and stuff like that. I agree. I think it is, it's really amazing that, you know, and I've told you and I told the other kids in Sunday school before that Mary was really young. She was like probably 14 years old. And so that was probably pretty scary for her. Um, and then, but this angel tells her, do you remember the angel says, do not be what? Afraid. Say that God. again. Do not be afraid. God is with you. That's exactly right. You, you said it perfectly. And so that's why I love the Christmas story is because there's this me these messages from God to all of these people that God is with us, that we don't have to be afraid. And no matter what, you know, we may not be like what Mary and Joseph are facing, but we have all of our own things that we're facing in this world, especially in 2020. And God is, right? And God is telling us not to be afraid and that he is with us. So today during the service, as we hear our, the rest of the parts of the Christmas story, I hope that you and me and everybody else listening can hear about all of the things that we have to hear to be reminded about God's love for us and that he's there for us. Marilee, is there anything that we can do to show people that we care? What is something that we can do in our life to show people that we care and that we are there for them? We can get some chalk and write inspiring messages on the sidewalk. I love that. Mm -hmm. And we can can do stuff like that. Put up signs, happy messages. That's exactly right. Because it's a very different time right now, right? We can't go and give somebody a hug that normally we would give a hug to. But we can send people, we can send letters, we can write emails, we can write chalk on the, we can put up a sign, all of those things. And I think that God, like God is always giving us that message that God loves us and is there for us. We can do that for people too. So I love those ideas. And I hope that as we hear the Christmas story today, we will all be thinking about how we can be like Jesus, be like God and share that love with people. Marilee, it's so nice to talk to you. I can't wait till we're back in church together on the steps, but thanks for having this conversation with me. And I hope you have a wonderful Advent and a wonderful Christmas season. Say, say hi to your parents for me, and I'll see you later. Okay, bye. Bye. Let us now be in an attitude of prayer together. Loving God, as we approach the day of Christ's birth, 
Help us to throw wide the doors of our hearts in preparation. Help us to sense the importance of what happened so long ago when Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel, to remember the words of the angels and the prophets and the teachers of old, and to celebrate all the promises that you made through them. Help us to take firm hold of the meaning of all these things and to know in the depths of our being that even now you are seeking to work in us and through us to fulfill the promises you have made. God of heavenly light, we remember that the hope of the world came to us in a child, and that event, in its quietness and simplicity, draws us to you in prayer. We rejoice and are joyful in this birth, and we are reminded that you have called us to be your children as well. Lord, may this Christmas season be for us and for those around us a season of healing. May it be a season of hope and of love and of joy. May it be a time of true sharing and of rejoicing in all the earth. We thank you for the joy of this season, for the love of community and the warmth it brings, for the celebration of worship and the inspiration of music, and for the peace of Christ which surpasses all of our understanding. We pray too for the children of our world and all those of tender faith, all those who have no home to call their home, all those who are hungry and thirsty. Bless, we pray, the innocent of the earth and all those who trust in you. Keep us strong in your spirit. Let us find joy in doing your will. We pray that the truth of your word will be felt upon our world and that you will guide us in all the important decisions which affect our future. We see about us the struggle for human rights and the basic necessities of life. Let us share in those struggles to relieve the world's sorrows and be joined in peace and justice for all of our human family. Just as wise ones made their journey to Bethlehem, we too begin a journey of faith. We sometimes falter and fail. We are aware of our limitations, our hurts and our anxieties but ultimately we will find our own place of belonging beside the manger. We pray today for all those we have named and for those in our hearts and in our minds. The light that shined out of darkness is a light for all the world to see. Let us be born anew in this hope as we receive Christ into our hearts. In the new year ahead, we rejoice to give God a place in our lives now and forever. And now we join our voices together to pray that prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're so glad you've joined us for worship today on this third Sunday of Advent. And we're also wanting you to come back this evening at 6.30 p.m. for our third annual holiday benefit concert that is organized and directed by our own worship leader at Harmony Toluca Lake, Melinda Hale. Melinda has put together a wonderful array of songs and singers, and you will want to be participating in this free concert. During this concert, we will be collecting funds for the families in either of our congregations who have been affected by COVID-19. So be sure to come in, tune in, and bring your credit card as well. Another way you can give this holiday season, if you didn't have a chance to give to our collection of gifts and cards for the families at Hope Gardens, we have a social worker in our congregation, Christina Hart, who has two families at Five Acres, where she works, who need some Christmas cheer. They are both headed by widows, and one family has two children, one has three children. I wrote about them in my From the Pastor last Friday, but if you would like to know more information on how you can participate in making these families' Christmas just a little bit brighter, email me at revkathy at hollywoodumc.org. All that we do here is made possible by you, by your prayers, your presence, your service, your witness, and your financial gifts. As we come close to the end of 2020, I hope that you will take stock of all that God has blessed you with and consider giving an additional gift to enable our ministries into 2021. 
May God bless you richly. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his word. She pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of Most High, and the Lord will give him to the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for who was said to be the barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but they, before they lived together, she was found to be with a child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man, unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her, in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are near, and you will meet him, Jesus, for he will save people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means... God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. When Joseph awoke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no martial relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their towns to be registered. Joseph had also went to the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, called Bethlehem, because he descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and to who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To, for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth peace among those 
who are favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they had made known what had been told them about this child. And all who had heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born, Bethlehem in Judea, Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For you, for Shem, come ruler, for who is shepherd, my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On the entire of the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. The opening the treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and mirth.
How great are our children, amen? I want to thank so much Cheryl Johnson Hartwell for directing our wonderful children's choir accompanied by John West. And what a wonderful presentation of the Christmas story by our children. Thank you to our terrific children's ministry team led by Kevin McCluskey and Reverend Lauren Dunkel and Zuki Gien. We are very, very blessed indeed. Today, we continue the season of Advent with our sermon series, Incarnation. This series, based on the book by Adam Hamilton, the pastor of the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City, focuses not on the how of God came to be born among us, but rather the why God chose to come to earth as the Christ, and the abundance of other titles, other names besides Jesus that have been attributed to him, names such as King, Emmanuel, Light of the World, Messiah, Prince of Peace. During Advent, we are exploring these names as well as how we might ourselves incarnate the reality of the Christ child into our own lives. We began this series with what it means to call Christ the King. Last Sunday, Reverend Denise spoke about Emmanuel, God with us. Today, our focus is on what it means to call Christ our Savior. What did the angel really mean when he said to Joseph that Mary's son, Jesus, would save people from their sins? What did the angel mean when saying to the shepherds, do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. And finally, what is our own calling to be instruments of salvation, to be deliverers, rescuers of others in these days? Let's first look at the name given to the Christ child, that of Jesus. Hamilton reminds us that Jesus is an anglicized version of his name, but that the Hebrew is Yeshua, a shortened version of Yehoshua. It comes from the personal name for God in Hebrew, Yahweh, and the word to save or to deliver, Yasha. Yeshua, therefore, means God saves, God delivers, or God helps. Jesus' name points to his role and the purpose of the incarnation. Jesus came as God's instrument of deliverance or salvation. Every time we speak his name, we are recognizing him as our Savior, deliverer, rescuer, and helper. Now, some of us today have names that identify our family or their historic occupations, uh, whatever the family lineage might be. For example, the name Cooper means barrel maker. Now, I suppose that somewhere way back in my paternal lineage, there is a line of barrel makers and they were recognized as such by one point, and that's how they got that name. It certainly does not identify me. 
But the name Jesus, meaning the one who saves, was a constant reminder to God's people that he would be the one to save them from their sins. So what does that even mean? Jesus has come to save us from our sins. Now, entire libraries are filled with answers to that question. So let me distill down for us what I think is essential to understand and to believe this Advent season. All of us, all of us fall short of the glory of God. Amen? But let me be really clear here. We fall short not because of who we are or because of whom we love. We fall short because we are human. We are imperfect beings. We are created in the image of God and God loves each of us without condition. Even when we stray, even when we go off course from the path that God desires for us, which is also known as sin, that doesn't change God's love for us. You know, we mess up every single day. Well, okay, I can't speak for you, but I mess up every single day. Sometimes in little ways and other times in big ones. But I have the assurance that God loves me and you have the assurance that God loves you. And how do we know that we've messed up? How do we know when we've strayed from God's path? Well, I think a lot of us just kind of know innately, but here's how we can be objectively sure. We know we've gotten on the wrong path, we've sinned, when we've not followed the two great commandments to love God and to love our neighbor. We know we've sinned or are sinning when we have not followed Jesus's teachings found in the Sermon on the Mount, and that's Matthew 5 through 7. We know we've fallen into sin when we've given in to any of the seven deadly sins that Paul names, lust, gluttony, sloth, envy, wrath, greed, or pride. We know we've sinned when we've not given a cup of cold water to someone who is thirsty and in whom we can see the face of Jesus. Family, the Christ child comes to us to illuminate the path that God wants us to be on. Jesus comes to us and says, hey, over here, follow me, not the ways of the world that too often can cause hurt and pain to others. Jesus says, follow me and allow my love, my teachings to guide your thoughts and actions. Jesus says, follow me and incarnate my great love for you so that you will know without a shadow of a doubt that even when you sin, when you mess up, I will always forgive you. My grace is always with you and there is nothing you can do that will stop me from loving you. The words save, deliver, and rescue all have the same root word in Hebrew and Greek. So here a new how Jesus saves us from our sins. Jesus works within us to deliver us, to rescue us from our human tendencies to go astray. And Jesus offers us a new way to live and to love as God intends. And then Jesus's willingness to love us all so deeply, even unto death on a cross, is but one of the reasons that we call him Savior. St. Paul, writing to the church at Rome in chapter 5, writes, But God proves his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Adam Hamilton reminds us that Jesus' death on the cross is meant to convey to us not only the depths of God's love, but also to paint a picture of the selfless love that Christ calls his followers to demonstrate. And we'll talk more about this next Lent and Easter, 
But for now, let's remember that Jesus chose to go to the cross because he loved us all so much. It wasn't a requirement made by an angry God as a sacrifice because we had sinned so much. No, it was exactly the opposite. The great theologians Marcus Ford and John Dominic Crossan once wrote, if a firefighter dies trying to save a child, we say that he sacrificed his life for her. He didn't need to suffer, nor was his death a substitution because God wanted a sacrifice and he took her place. It's important that we not conflate sacrifice and suffering and substitution. No, instead, it's important that we see the death and resurrection of Jesus as the power of love to conquer all, a redemptive love that takes us beyond this earthly life into the life to come. This is the love that came down at Christmas, the love that we are waiting to be born again among us, the love that is Emmanuel, God with us, and the love that enables us to be used by God to rescue, to save, to deliver others. Throughout the Bible and throughout history, there are stories of how God has used people to bring forth healing and hope and deliverance and salvation. The same is true today. We especially see it in our frontline healthcare workers, be they people of any faith or of no faith. God is working through each of them to bring forth healing and comfort to those diagnosed with COVID-19. We see it in our own Reverend Sarah Lamar Sterling, who works as a hospital chaplain here in the South Bay, and in Reverend Lauren Dunkel, who works as a hospice chaplain. They are both offering care and support and being the presence of God in these unprecedented times to families, to people who are suffering and in pain. The late Presbyterian pastor, Fred Rogers, famously said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Family, that is our calling today, to open ourselves to be the helpers, to be the deliverers, to be the rescuers, the instruments of salvation to those who need to hear and experience the good news of God's great love. How? Well, maybe it's picking up the phone and calling someone you won't be able to visit this Christmas. Maybe it's writing a letter or a card to brighten someone's day and actually putting it in a mailbox. Perhaps it's rescuing a dog or cat from your local shelter. Whatever it is, it will come because you have opened your heart to God's great love for each of us and for all of us. I wanna close with a story that I haven't told in a very long time. When our boys were little, we as a family used to love to go to SeaWorld. And one time we went and our older son was around five and our other one was two. And we were walking from one part of the park to another and we came around the sky tower and we saw a little girl crying and we didn't know what, what, what to do uh, because she seemed to be all by herself. And so Renee and I were talking to one another about what to do and should we get someone. And our five-year-old, in the meantime, had gone to the little girl to find out what was wrong, came back to us and told us that she was lost. She didn't know where her parents were. And we said, okay, well, let's, let's try and figure this out. <laughs> and my brilliant son said, you're a pastor. Help her. He only said that to me and not to his dad, but you know, the way it was. So we did. We took her by the hand. Uh, he had one hand, I had another. And we took her into the security office, which was almost at the other end of the park. And we got in there just about the same time as frantic parents who had been searching for this little girl got there. All it took was recognizing 
tears, and a cry for help. And who did that? Our five-year-old. That's the definition of what it means for a little child shall lead them. Allow ourselves this Advent season to be led by a child. Allow us to hear the cries of this world and respond to them. And let us believe the words of the angel. When the angel said, do not be afraid, for I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. Amen.